Today, we continue on exploring the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. This is week seven, six, actually. Week six of us covering this wonderful uh, sutta that is full of so much, so much of the Dhamma. There's also many, many human relational factors, interactions that really bring up and bring out the humanity, the interactions between individuals, especially that which takes place between a teacher and the student. Perhaps we might have seen some of the aspects of ourselves within Venerable Ananda in the last few weeks that we've been covering the sutta and seeing how many frailties that sometimes are omitted, sometimes we deify, sometimes we really make these individuals who really lived and have taught and have had interactions with Lord Buddha, as well as Lord Buddha, into these otherworldly entities, beings that are not in any way possibly relatable with us in our situations. And we see that that is not the case. And this is a, a risk that every single uh, movement that is meaningful in human history, any kind of endeavor, that sooner or later, when other beings, other people over the course of time come in contact with it, they start to make it, or rather take it out of the human context. So that's another uh, quality that I would like you to uh, consider while going over this sutta, especially because now it really gets into the um, portion of the Buddha's life, of the sasana's life, in the beginning, beginning stages of the sasana, meaning the ending of Lord Buddha's life on this planet. And the human um, factors that I was mentioning, specifically that of loss, uh, is really going to be kicking in in this um, in this section in the one to come next week. But uh, next week will, by the way, I will try my best to uh, conclude the sutta, and uh, it's already fully uh, completed. It's it's done. It's on the website. The translation of it, uh, I mean, so it's no longer going to be in sections. So I combined all the sections into one and uh, including the next, uh, which is the part six. So last week we saw how one of the misinterpretations in the Sasana's life, specifically that involving Lord Buddha's last meal was covered, where I discussed how people's mistaken notions or especially the commentators, and not just the ones from or ages gone by or centuries gone by, but even modern day commentators and uh, translators, both in print and on uh, online digital form, um, who continue to translate suttas. And they oftentimes do a wonderful job in making the suttas available for the masses. Nevertheless, still make that huge mistake of uh, including that portion where Lord Buddha ate a bad last meal, the bad pork or something of that nature where he was uh, consequently poisoned by it. That whole uh, scenario, which was completely convoluted and has nothing to do with what we see in the suttas. The term was Sukara Maddava, which was the meal 
the last meal that had to be so uh, uh, delicious, so over the top, good, the truffle meal. And back in those days, it was as expensive, if not more, than it is today. So equally so. So um, we uh, discussed that, as well as some of the issues that Venerable Ananda had had, especially in context of uh, not being able to provide a cup of water. And, uh, and uh, so all those things I'd like, I'd like you to revisit. So like all the suttas, but especially and specifically this sutta needs to be revisited because there's a wealth of information there that we can really boost up and re-energize our practice with. Ultimately, that's why we study the suttas, not to sharpen our intellectual prowess, but to really become more and more humble and go into the practice mode of the Dhamma. That's why we have to study the suttas, to keep us in check ourselves, especially when we come across the fact of death, where Lord Buddha says, all things are conditioned. Vaya dhammam sankhara appamadena sampadetha, Lord Buddha says at the end before he closes his eyes to the bhikkhus. All things are conditioned. Make sure your mindfulness stays sharp. You strive again and again and again to maintain your mindfulness. Imagine he said those words in the last millisecond before he passed away. So let's dig into the part five. This one is entitled At Kushinara or Kusinara. Section 26 The Twin Sal Trees or Sala Trees. Last place of rest. Then the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Ananda by saying, Come, Ananda, let us cross over to the other side of the Hiranyavati River and make our way to the Malla's Sal Forest of Upavattana in Kusinara. As you wish, Bhante, replied Ananda. And the Blessed One, together with a large Sangha of bhikkhus, crossed over to the other side of the Hiranyavati River, as they all made their way to the Sal forest of the Mallas of Upavattana in the district of Kusinara. And it was there that the Blessed One spoke to the Venerable Ananda by saying, Please, Ananda, prepare for me a sleeping mat between those twin sal trees, with the head pointing to the north. I am tired, Ananda, and want to lie down. As you wish, blessed Lord, replied the Venerable Ananda, as he did what the Blessed One had asked. Then the Blessed One laid down on his right side in the lion's posture, resting one foot upon the other, with complete mindfulness and full awareness. Sati and Sampajanya, having already determined in his mind the time for rising up. And that was always Lord Buddha's way of resting, whether it was sleep, just normal nightly sleep, or just taking a nap. He would always make sure that the time was set in his mind. And that's one of the reasons why teachers of meditation um, who really want the best for their students will always encourage them at one point or another to do away with the clock, relying on the clock. The teacher will encourage the student to slowly trust their internal clock, starting with the time of waking up. Instead of saying, I will wake up at six or five or seven, whatever it is, in your mind, set the determination to say, hmm, I want to wake up. Please wake me up. This is you speaking to yourself. Please wake me up at, let's say if it's 7, at 6.55 or 6.58. And after you try this a few times, and you don't punish yourself or judge yourself when that doesn't happen a few times, but eventually it will happen. 
it will happen in the mind, especially if it's in a state of calm and tranquility, when you are encouraging yourself. And similarly, when you're meditating, saying to yourself, okay, I have decided to sit for one hour. And you sit, but you don't bother about the time. You don't open your eyes. You don't look over, sneak in a look, a gaze towards the clock. You just trust. So this is another thing that we need to develop in our practice. And lo and behold, you open your eyes, and, and by the way, you're, you're at uh, the 60-minute mark or whatever it was that you determined. So these are not, uh, you know, uh, fairy tale things, or these are not like special skills that only Lord Buddha had. Whatever Lord Buddha had, whatever, as far as a meditator, whatever he showed the way, rather, that was possible for a human being, that is possible for us today, 26 centuries almost later. No difference as far as our abilities go. So don't believe your internal monologue when it says otherwise just then so lord venerable ananda setting up the mat and lord buddha is about to lay down just then the sal trees around the blessed one suddenly broke out into full bloom even though it was not their season for flowering if you've ever seen a sal tree it's quite lovely when it's in full bloom and the smell, the fragrance of the flowers is so amazing. It's so wonderful. It's so subtle, but it permeates everywhere around it. It might even convince you that it's coming from somewhere else. That's how humble the fragrance of the sal flowers are or is. And the sal tree blossoms started to rain down upon the body of the Tathagata while they fell and scattered about him, being strewn in loving worship of the Tathagata. And if you've seen a sal tree's flowers, they're so tender, they're so fragile, they keep falling. When I was in Malaysia at the Vihara, Buddhist Mahavihara, I was there and there was one, there is one sal tree. And uh, I would be very careful not to touch the flowers when I really would get close to smell the fragrance. And because suddenly I would go to get my meal and come back and I would look down, look at the flower where the flower was, and it's no longer there because the petals have fallen down. So that's how fragile it is. So, and it would be so beautiful underneath the tree surrounding it. So one can imagine how lovely it was, the scene where Lord Buddha was. Then suddenly the celestial mandarava flowers and heavenly sun, sandalwood powder also began raining down from the sky upon the body of the Tathagata as they scattered about him, being strewn in loving worship of the Tathagata. Mandarava flowers are, as it says in the sutta, flowers that are only within, found within the celestial realm. Now, when that is taking place, that means definitely there are devas around. <laughs> they're showing, they're manifesting part of their domain into the physical human world because the individual, the teacher whom they have come to respect, pay their you know, homage to is a human being. And uh, so this is where the bridging of the gap is taking place again. But now... You don't have to be someone with the Dibba Chakku, the divine eye, to be able to see these things. They are manifesting it. Meanwhile, heavenly choir voices softly sang along with heavenly instruments playing divine music in honor of and reverence for the Tathagata. And the Blessed One spoke to the Venerable Ananda by saying, Ananda, the twin sal trees broke out into full bloom even though it was not their season for flowering. The sal tree blossoms have started to rain down upon the body of the Tathagata, while they fall and scatter about me, being strewn in loving worship of the Tathagata. Not only that, but the celestial mandarava flowers and heavenly sandalwood powder have also begun raining down from the sky upon the body 
of the Tathagata as they scatter about me, being strewn in loving worship of the Tathagata. Meanwhile, the heavenly... So Lord Buddha is repeating what we just went over. But Ananda, this is really not how the Tathagata is to be truly respected, venerated, cherished, loved, and honored in the highest degree. So all this is not the way to pay puja, to pay homage to Lord Buddha, he's saying. Not even what the devas are doing. Ananda, it is when a bhikkhu or a bhikkhuni, a male or female lay disciple, upasaka or upasika, lives by the dhamma, lives and practices properly as taught in the dhamma, walks in the way of the dhamma, for it is by such a person that the tathagata is to be truly respected, venerated, cherished, loved, and honored in the highest degree. He's saying this to whom? Venerable Ananda, who has fallen into just a way of thinking as, uh, as a mere, I can't say putujjana, because he was already a seka, a noble disciple, seeing that he was already a sotapanna. But he was falling into the emotionality of the whole experience that he was witnessing. It's very easy. When we become very emotional, it's an upakilesa after all. It's a distortion, corruption of the mind. And he's saying, no, 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 no. Ananda, come back. Come back to the fact. Come back to what it, the Dhamma is really supposed to be doing for you. Why you're even in robes, Ananda? Why you're even in robes? Pay attention to the work that you need to be doing. Practice the Dhamma, Ananda. You are a wealth. You are a library of the Dhamma, Ananda, I say. Pick any of the teachings I've given you and practice. Therefore, Ananda, you should train yourselves in this manner. We shall live by the Dhamma, live and practice properly as taught in the Dhamma, as we walk in the way of the Dhamma. Section 27. The Venerable Upavana, the grief of the gods. It was at that time that the Venerable Upavana was standing before the Blessed One, fanning him. And the Blessed One rebuked him by saying, Move aside, Bhikkhu, do not stand in front of me. There were many Bhikkhus, but Venerable Upavana was standing just there and it wasn't like they were as many as, let's say, blades of grass around them in the South Forest. But he moved him. He, he almost, in a chastising way, just like, move, Bhikkhu. And the thought came to the Venerable Ananda. This Venerable Upavana has been attending to the Blessed One for a long time, closely associating with him and serving him. Yet now, in his final hours, the Blessed One rebukes him. I wonder what the reason for this could be. What might be the cause for the Blessed One to rebuke the Venerable Upavana in this manner by saying, move aside, Bhikkhu, do not stand in front of me. And the Venerable Ananda conveyed what he was thinking to the Blessed One. And the Blessed One said, Ananda, hardly any devas are left throughout the tenfold world systems who are not already gathered here all come together to gaze upon the Tathagata for the final time. Ananda, for a distance of 12 yojanas around the Sala forest of the Mallas, in the district of Kusinara, there is not a spot that could be pricked with the tip of a hair, which is not filled with powerful deities. And these gods, Ananda, are complaining. So yojana, by the way, is about seven miles, each yojana. So seven times 12, from that point all the way out to the edge of Kusinara, in that surrounding, he says, there's not a point where you can even prick at with a single tip of a hair, where it's not occupied by some deva or a Brahma god. So Lord Buddha says, the gods, the devas, the Brahmas are complaining. 
by saying, we have come from afar to gaze upon the Tathagata, for so rare in the world is the arising of Tathagatas, Arahants, fully awakened ones. And on this day, in the last watch of the night, the Tathagatas, Parinibbana, will take place. But this bhikkhu of great powers has placed himself right in front of the Blessed One, concealing him, obstructing our view of the Blessed Lord, so that now, at the very end, we are prevented from looking at him. And they can come and move their, you know, use their, you know, abilities to move uh, Venerable Upavana. That would be rude because the devas are very respectful of bhikkhus. So they're sitting there uh, frustrated, many of them. In this manner, Ananda, the devas were complaining. Just how many different classes of devas are gathered here that the Blessed One is aware of at this moment? Ananda, there are devas, both those in the sky and the ones who are connected to earth. They have their hair all disheveled as they weep and mourn, flailing their uplifted arms in tears, flinging themselves on the ground. They roll from side to side, sobbing with sorrowful cries. Too soon has the Blessed One come to his Parinibbana. Too soon has the Sugata come to his Parinibbana. Too soon will the eye of the world vanish forever from our sight. Because once an Arahant dies, that's it. No Deva, no Brahma God with all of their powers can ever see them again. They're gone. And they know this. This is the final encounter that they have. So sometimes people forget that Devas uh, are... Uh, to a great extent, very much like us in the way that we demonstrate emotion, heavy emotion, especially the ones that are closest to our uh, levels of, in, in the Buddhist cosmology. Um, and the higher up you go, you know, if you get to the pure abodes, it, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't move them anymore. And we'll see why, um, but in a minute, but they're flailing their arms just like human beings. They're in tears just like human beings. But those gods who are freed from passion, Lord Buddha says, who are mindful and fully aware are currently reflecting in this way. All things that are conditioned are also impermanent. Therefore, how could there be any other outcome than this? Now, it's not just the Brahmas in the pure abodes, the Anagamis, in those realms, who are the ones who would be saying these things? The, the realization that's there, captured in that statement, but also other devas who have attained that state, but they are still living the life of a deva in that realm, whatever realm there might be in, they might be in. So uh, just a clarification there. Section 28. The four spiritually inspiring locations. Venerable Ananda's concern. In the past, Bhante, after having completed the Vassa, whenever bhikkhus left their regions, they would set out to come and see the Tathagata. This was also a great opportunity for us, as we would again benefit from receiving and associating with those very revered bhikkhus who would come to have an audience with the Blessed One and to wait upon him. But, Bhante, after the Blessed One is gone, we shall no longer have that benefit of paying homage. So, bhikkhus would always congregate. They would sooner or later show up wherever Lord Buddha was. So, even if it were once, but they would show up to pay their respect. So, they would travel long distances to come there. And Venerable Ananda, at least for the 25 years that he was Lord Buddha's uh, attendant, companion, he would see these encounters and he would gain so much. He would gain so much and he would appreciate because after all, these are Kalyana Mittas. And many, many of them who were visiting Lord Buddha were Arahats. Sometimes we forget that Lord Buddha was not surrounded by Arahants all the time. Sometimes they were just putujana monks. 
and you can see his sadness and uh, you know in that situation he wasn't always with venerable sariputta or venerable mahaka sapa he wasn't so sometimes there would be some arahants but whenever an arahant would show up that would be a wonderful time for venerable ananda to engage and learn so that is his his concern one of them anyhow and this is lord buddha's response to that ananda there are four spiritually inspiring locations where a faithful person and those of good families should visit and look upon with a heart full of appreciation and reverence. What are these four? Here the Tathagata was born. So that place where Lord Buddha was born, the Tathagata, that is one of the four spiritually inspiring places. Thus reflecting on and the faithful person and those of good families visit the spiritually inspiring location where the Tathagata was born, looking upon it with a heart full of appreciation and reverence. Number two, here the Tathagata became fully awakened as the Samma Sambuddha, the supremely and unsurpassed awakened one. So the place of his awakening, meaning Bodhgaya, in the state of Bihar. Thus reflecting Ananda, and by the way, the first one was in, is in Lumbini, uh, it's interesting how uh, over time, because of the popularity of, you know, everybody wants to have their own place. Uh, uh, when you get so many, you know, pilgrims coming in. Uh, so if you go on a pilgrimage, don't be surprised to find that there's a Lumbini uh, in, in um, there's a birthplace, uh, especially in the case of Kapilavatu. There's one in India, one in uh, Nepal. So it used to be one big India, but it just happens that over the centuries, you know, with colonial times, this and that, and the division of the country, that area, um, today it falls in the section of Nepal, uh, in the city of uh, Lumbini, uh, the birthplace of Lord Buddha. So this was the Bodh Gaya, however. Thus reflecting Ananda, the faithful person and those of good families visit the spiritually inspiring location where the Tathagata attains supreme and unsurpassed enlightenment, looking upon it with a heart full of appreciation and reverence. It's a wonderful place, and I have given at least one or two talks on this. Uh, and uh, after I had done my pilgrimage uh, in India and Nepal, and it's very moving to be there and to see so many people coming and paying homage um, and uh, people of different races, different even denominations, branches, traditions of the Dhamma and people who are not even Buddhists um, circumambulating around the main shrine. So it's, it's Lord Buddha's uh, mentioning that as another spiritually uh, inspiring location. Here, the Tathagata set the supreme wheel of Dhamma in motion. So this is number three, location number three. And this is in Sarnat, in the uh, city of Varanasi or Benares, and um, where we have the area called Isipatana, the Deer Park. There's a beautiful uh, stupa there, constructed. And thus reflecting Ananda, the faithful person, and those of good families visit the spiritually inspiring location where the Tathagata set the supreme wheel of Dhamma in motion, looking upon it with a heart full of appreciation and reverence. Next, we get to the big one, which is the place that they are at, at that moment. Number four, here the Tathagata passed away by attaining the final full release of the Nibbana element with no residues remaining. Anupadisesa. Um, that's what that last portion means. No residues remaining in Pali. Thus reflecting Ananda, the faithful person and those of good families visit the spiritually inspiring location where the Tathagata attained the final full release of the Nibbana element with no residues remaining, looking upon it with a heart full of appreciation and reverence. These, Ananda, are the four spiritually inspiring locations where a faithful person 
and those of good families should visit and look upon with a heart full of appreciation and reverence. And truly, there will come to these places, Ananda, those faithful bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, those faithful male and female lay disciples while they reflect. So he's saying, Ananda, don't fret or worry. There are places where these arahants, these bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, upasikas, and upasikas could still go to. And you can go to these places yourself. And as you're paying homage, you will come across them. So these are your kalyanamittas, in other, in other words. So while they reflect, he says, here the Tathagata was born. Here the Tathagata became fully awakened as the Samma Sambuddha the supremely and unsurpassed awakened one. Here the Tathagata set the supreme wheel of Dhamma in motion, and here the Tathagata passed away by attaining the final full release of the Nibbana element with no residues remaining. And if, Ananda, anyone should die while making such a pilgrimage to these four spiritually inspiring locations, but with strong faith and confidence in his heart firmly established, Upon the breaking up of the body after death, he will be reborn into a happy state, enjoying the bliss of heavenly realm. It's nice to have that uh, promise <laughs> by Lord Buddha. And uh, having been to these places, uh, um, these places do have an energy about them. For example, there is a jubilant energy around in the area around Lumbini, um, where uh, the site of Lord Buddha's birth is. And uh, there's pools, and there's beautiful trees and uh, Bodhi, Bodhi trees. And uh, I remember looking at the even the leaves hanging from on the on the tree, this huge tree. And looking at the leaves, you can see the sun's rays dancing through the leaves. And I saw these huge um, flocks, if I can call that, uh, call it that, uh, flocks of butterflies. And they were joining, they were not moving away with people standing close by. So there was this, almost this festive attitude, festive atmosphere in the air. Versus being at Bodh Gaya, where this quiet, quiet, subdued, blissful quiet. And all you have to do is keep your thoughts from interrupting that space. Sometimes somebody might step on your toe because there's so many people coming and going, and you're sitting in quiet and meditation. But it doesn't bother you. Dogs bark. Do dogs sometimes come and sit on your lap suddenly because you're such a pleasant presence <laughs> for them. You're not bothered by any of this. And the same goes with, with the other two sites. So uh, they have their, um, I guess one would be tempted to say, energy signature that corresponds to whatever happened as you're driving or as the bus is taking you towards Kushinara, you notice the trees kind of bending their heads, their tips, the, you know, they're bending. They're kind of like walking with Lord Buddha towards Kushinara in sadness. And you can feel the sadness. You will feel the sadness if you're in tune with whatever the energies are in that area. When you walk into Kushinara, there's this sadness about the place. You don't know why, but there is. So, um, yeah, I wanted to share those personal um, experiences uh, briefly with you in connection to what we just read. Section 29, further questions from the Venerable Ananda. Then the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Bhante, how should we conduct ourselves when it comes to women? Now, this is interesting. <laughs> We're living in a time, 21st century, where we have to be very, very politically correct, but we toss that out when we're studying the Dhamma, when we're looking at what Lord Buddha said. So, 
So Venerable Ananda is asking, how should we conduct ourselves when it comes to, so Lord uh, Venerable Ananda is talking about them as the bhikkhus. How should we relate with women now? Do not look at them, Ananda. <laughs> Some people have issues with this. But our rules are very specific. People are people, unless you're dealing with arahants. But it's very important for the bhikkhu to understand. Now, for example, in Pindapada, when we're doing the alms round, when we're walking or when someone is even serving us, sometimes the bhikkhu is, this is modern day, the, the bhikkhu is uh, given food at the vihara, the dining area, or sometimes the bhikkhu is invited to an outside place, someone's house, as the case was many, many times we see in the case of Lord Buddha and his uh, salvakas. So people are serving you food. So sometimes people can think, well, now I can drop my guard or, or I can behave normally, quote unquote. No, you need to maintain control over your eyes, your sight. Plus, you, don't, you might have control over yourself, but you don't know what's happening in the other person. The eyes are very, very powerful. They convey so much. And even when you think that you have your precepts well under control, as they say, you don't. When you open your eyes or you lift your gaze above the alms bowl and you look at this person who is so full of perhaps devotion. But they convey some other things or your kilesas show up. Suddenly your defilements are talking about it to you in your heart when you are fast asleep or going to sleep or when you're sitting. These are things that Lord Buddha knew very well to be a major problem. But today I see modern day bhikkhus who just shove that aside. When you look at pictures, even more, you know, recent pictures, uh, I mean, recent, uh, relatively speaking, um, from the 60s and, and that time period of Venerable uh, Webu Sayadaw, for example, the eyes are always lowered. The eyes are always lowered. He would never be looking at someone unless he's teaching the Dhamma, unless he's answering a question pertaining to the Dhamma. And he was an arahant, mind you. <laughs> so automatically, the eyes start to drift downwards. But Lord Buddha is talking here, and Venerable Ananda is referring to those bhikkhus who are not yet of that level. So don't look at them, Ananda, he says. But, blessed Lord, what if we do have to look at them? <laughs> They're asking a question. They're people, just like you. Then do not engage in a conversation with them, Ananda. I've seen clips of videos of uh, Pindapada, of, even with Thai forest monks who I've heard them personally claiming that they are the most orthodox when it comes to the practice of the Vinaya rules. They're the, they're the ones who really live it. I've heard them many times say that many places. And to some extent, they were. But this is a video I've seen, and this is not a unique case. I've personally witnessed them in, when I was in such surroundings, where the bhikkhu is engaging in a conversation while the person, a woman, let's say, is placing food into their bowl. Not only eye contact, but speaking, and not only speaking, but laughing. This is a serene moment where the faith in the heart of the layperson could really flourish, being moved and inspired by our behavior as bhikkhus. So when you bring it down to the more mundane level, because that's what's happening, you're engaging, you're reminding the viewer you're reminding the person who's looking at you that, hey, I am a 
human being with your eye contact. Next, you're also conveying, I am a man. You're also conveying that without saying a word. And when there's laughter, you're taking it to a totally different level, more vulgar level, without you even knowing. Because remember, you are not in the mind of the other person. Every single behavior you have is extremely important. That's why we have these rules. The way we move, the way we sit, the way we move our robes sometimes, you know, especially when you're not wearing shirts underneath, because in this case, it's, it's very frigid here where I am. But what if you're not wearing those except for the upper robe and you move? The eyes will look. They're always, you're under scrutiny. So all these things Lord Buddha knew about. And he's reminding Ananda. And don't forget, Venerable Ananda was also aware of these, but he's also surrounded by the other bhikkhus. He's like, Bhante, could you tell us about how we're supposed to relate to women? Basically, so that the younger bhikkhus could hear from Lord Buddha himself, instead of later on pointing the finger at Venerable Ananda and saying, you don't know what you're talking about. Why are you being so strict, for example? They could say that. So Lord Buddha says, then don't engage in conversation with them. But blessed Lord, what if they start speaking to us? <laughs> I mean, come on, you would be rude otherwise if you don't speak back. Then Ananda, you should proceed carefully with mindfulness firmly established in you. Don't do anything. I mean, it was already supposed to be there, your mindfulness. As you were in that same milieu, in the surrounding, as this... Um, uh, female was, let's say. Then the Venerable Ananda continued with yet another question. Bhante, so he's now switching gears. How should we act as it relates to venerating and honoring the body of the Tathagata? So this is where Lord Buddha really, uh, I would say, uh, another lion's roar as it relates to bhikkhus and ceremonies and pujas. This is, uh, you know, um, if you've been following me or listening to me giving even a single Dhamma talk on this subject, you know my position on the puja thing. Um, it's not part of the practice. It's, it's minor, very, very minor. Enough so to inculcate, inculcate a sense of faith. That's it. Lord Buddha's reminding Ananda by saying these words. Do not get involved with such trifle matters, Ananda, such as respecting and venerating the body of the Tathagata. Instead, you should strive diligently, Ananda, applying exceptional effort as you zealously engage in your own practice, working on towards attaining the highest goal of the holy life, becoming an Arahant. Therefore, Ananda, be unflinching in your determination, ardent and resolute. After all, Ananda, there are wise nobles, wise Brahmins, meaning householders, and wise householders, yes, who are devoted to the Tathagata. And it is they who will do the venerating and honoring of the body of the Tathagata. So leave such trifle matters to them. Every single Vihara nowadays, every single Buddhist temple nowadays, has its relics. I've said, just go ahead and do the math. How is that even possible? To have each, and they don't have just one relic. Sometimes they have several in one container. And there are huge industries around the world in Southeast Asia. Sri Lanka, Thailand, Burma. You go and there's shops dedicated to building containers. Ornate, lovely, this and that. Just to house the relics. And that becomes the tradition. That becomes the path. That becomes the very religious practice of the person. They look forward for that one event where they will, uh, or they invite the bhikkhus over to their home, and the bhikkhus, pièce de la résistance, as they say, will bring the relics to their house, to bless the house. And that is it. They don't practice meditation. There's no, there's no, there's none of that. 
So it's very ritualized. And Lord Buddha is saying, don't do that ritualization, nonsense. Leave it to the lay people. Your job. I mean, you're in robes, Bhikkhu. He's saying to Ananda, why are you even asking me this stupid question? Then the Venerable Ananda said, but Bhante, what are the protocols and how they should conduct the procedure of venerating and honoring the body of the Tathagata? This is a legitimate question because lay people are going to, later on we're going to see, come and ask Venerable Ananda because he was the prime diplomat in a sense. He, don't forget, he is royalty. So he knew all these protocols except for this. So he's asking Bhante, how should we go ahead and uh, conduct the veneration of the body? How should we go about cremating the Lord Buddha's body? And what do we do, et cetera, with the relics and all these things? So this is a legitimate question. They should follow the same protocols, Ananda, as they would while venerating and honoring the body of a wheel-turning universal monarch. Uh, this is in Pali, the term is Chakkavattin. Chakkavattin is a very rare uh, being. In, in many ways, very uh, um, as rare as the appearance of, of a Buddha, of a Tathagata. Because when they do show up, they rule by, without force. <laughs> they rule by the Dhamma, the suttas say. And you have so many suttas discussing the Chakravatin in detail, especially in the Diganikaya. Uh, so he's Lord Buddha saying the same way they would uh, respect and honor uh, uh, Chakravatin, universal wheel turn. Wheel turning is the one who turns the Dhamma wheel. So Lord Buddha starts the wheel and the Chakravatin continues doing so, but in a, um, in a fashion where uh, well, he's living with the Eightfold Path. He conquers new kingdoms by simply having introduced the Eightfold Path, and kingdoms just open up to him. And uh, there's also the other eight uh, unique uh, possessions that a Chakravatin would have, but that's irrelevant here. And Venerable Ananda asks, and what are the procedures and protocols, Bhante, to be followed in venerating and honoring the body of a wheel-turning universal monarch? The body of a wheel-turning universal monarch, Ananda, is first wrapped around with new linen and then with teased cotton wool. So very carefully made into uh, it's clean. And so it is done up to 500 pieces of linen cloth and 500 pieces made of cotton wool. Once this is done, then the body of the wheel-turning universal monarch is placed in a golden vessel filled with sesame oil, which is then placed inside another golden vessel, after which a funeral pyre is built, comprised of all kinds of sweet-scented wood. And so the body of the wheel-turning universal monarch is burned and cremated. Afterwards, a stupa mound is raised at a crossroads built from bricks for the wheel turning universal monarch. Thus, Ananda, the same procedure is followed in relation to the body of the Tathagata, whereby a stupa mount is to be raised at a crossroads. By the way, crossroads because it's a junction point. Many travelers will pass through, and as they do so, that will be an opportunity for them to pay their homage, their respect. And uh, the built, uh, being built by bricks, you go to India and to this day you will find these mounds. Uh, of course, uh, the Emperor Ashoka retouched them. So um, in his reign, he, um, he had seen within 300 years time, many of these stupas um, were dilapidated. They were crumbling, just being destroyed by time and weathering. So he removed with such uh, respect and veneration and huge festivities, um, the relics, uh, and then built bigger, much bigger, much more durable uh, stupas. Um, and uh, you will see them uh, in India. Even the bricks, the one that comes to mind, there's so many, but uh, Lady Sujata's uh, stupa, 
comes to mind, um, as well as the one in Kushinara. And whoever shall visit that place with garlands or incense or sandal paste or pay reverence with the calm serenity of the heart, that act itself will be for his lasting happiness and well-being for a very long time. Section 30. Those worthy of stupas. Ananda, there are these four beings who are worthy of stupas to be built in their memory. Who are these four? A Tathagata, who is an Arahant, a fully self-awakened Buddha. That's what Samma Sambuddha means. Is worthy of a stupa. So is a Pacheka Buddha. Pacheka Buddha is a Buddha that shows up in a time period. Uh, even though it's a dark period where there's no Dhamma as such, teachings as such, uh, of the previous Tathagata, however, they attain through their own effort, but they're unable to teach it. And some people, some commentators I've seen, some scholars I've heard say, they're able to teach it, but they don't want to. So in either case, the Pacheka Buddha is not opening his mouth. He's not sharing the Dhamma. But nevertheless, it's a Buddha. So such a being also is deserving of a stupa. And number three is, the Lord Buddha says, as well as a disciple of a Tathagata. That means any one of you, one of you, any one of you who attains to Arahantship is deserving of a stupa. And Lord Buddha adds the fourth individual, he says, and a wheel-turning universal monarch is deserving, a chakavatin is deserving of a stupa. Nowadays, of course, every uh, bhikkhu, pretty much, in most all of the traditions, you know, Mahayana, Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana, they all get their own stupas. So sometimes it's, it's a reverence on the part of their students, the community, their upasakas, upasikas, perhaps. But uh, now we see who really deserves a stupa or not. And Lord Buddha says, and why is it, Ananda, that a Tathagata, who is an Arahant, a fully self-awakened Buddha, is worthy of a stupa? Because, Ananda, at the very thought that one has, this is the stupa of that blessed one, the Arahant, the fully awakened one, the hearts of many beings will become serenely calm and happy. By becoming thus tranquil and with strong faith and confidence in their hearts firmly established, as a result, upon the breaking up of the body after death, they will be reborn into a happy state, enjoying the bliss of heavenly realms. Just being in that state, it's an opportunity. In a, in a sense, uh, I, one might even say, it's, it's uh, metaphorically speaking, it's a gateway metaphorically speaking. Um, and also, at the thought, this is the stupa of that Pacheka Buddha, or this is the stupa of the disciple of the Tathagata, who is an Arahant, the fully awakened one, the teacher, I mean, not the student. Or this is the stupa of that righteous, wheel-turning universal monarch who ruled according to Dhamma. The hearts of many beings will become serenely calm and happy. And he repeats that section. This Ananda is, <coughs> excuse me, is therefore the reason for these four beings who are worthy of stupas to be built in their memory. Section 31. Venerable Ananda's wonderful qualities. Venerable Ananda's lament. Now, last week uh, and the week before, I, I've discussed, uh, as I was mentioning in the beginning of this uh, today's uh, discourse, how... Um, Venerable Ananda did several things, or not do, depending on how you look at it, uh, certain things that we look down upon. There's something, things that were unbecoming of a bhikkhu, especially the attendant to the Tathagata. We're not the only ones who have witnessed these. We've witnessed these through texts 26 centuries later, but there were bhikkhus around, Lord Buddha, who were seeing this and who were talking amongst themselves. And don't forget, just like in the case of Chunda, 
the one who offered the goldsmith, the one who offered the last meal. Lord Buddha did give very specific instructions to the bhikkhus not to uh, in any way uh, smudge the reputation, the memory of Chunda, the goldsmith, who made the offering of the last meal to Lord Buddha. Instead, to honor it as such a wonderful, wonderful, um, auspicious event. Similarly, Venerable Buddha, uh, Lord Buddha is, is uh, now going to be giving a similar disclaimer or a waiver, not waiver, but uh, a recognition as to the great qualities of Venerable Ananda so that we, future generations, don't look at Venerable Ananda in such a dim light and look at him and say, ah, how could you? How could you? So Lord Buddha is putting this there in place so that individuals, and especially the bhikkhus, will uh, bear in mind when they uh, hear about these events of the last days of Lord Buddha. Then the Venerable Ananda went into a quiet pavilion within the Vihara, and leaning against the doorpost, he began weeping. It's interesting how even these details are there in the sutta. The doorpost, the hinges, where he's leaning. You can almost visualize him leaning, and perhaps it's his right hand, right arm lifted, and he's leaning against it, and he is crying. He's, he's in tears. And we have his thoughts here, kept in the sutta. He says, my master, who has been so compassionate towards me all these years, is about to pass away into Parinibbana forever. But alas, I am still only a noble disciple in training, and with so much work to do for my own liberation. He's so disappointed in himself. And he's seeing this. And sometimes I've seen uh, students um, that are full of, of such disappointment. I see it in, on retreats. And it's inevitable. It happens to all of us, all of us. But please be mindful to have metta towards you to have kindness towards you, and we will see why. At that moment, the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus next to him by asking, bhikkhus, where is Ananda? Lord Buddha was seeing what was happening. He doesn't need to ask them. He knows. But he's asking, nevertheless, because he picked up his thoughts. The Venerable Ananda Bhante has gone into a quiet pavilion within the Vihara. And leaning against the doorpost, he is weeping. My master, so he repeats, they repeat what he is saying. Apparently, he said it audibly, loudly, and other bhikkhus have heard, and they're conveying to him. Because remember, there is no vihara as such. Wherever the bhikkhus gather, that becomes a vihara, if it, even if it's in the forest. So this was in the middle of the forest. Remember that. So there's tons and tons. There's, you know, a large number of bhikkhus there, so they're seeing. So, but it's interesting how they said the doorpost. So one might look at that with, you know, if you're doing textual analysis, you're like, hmm, where did the doorpost or the door come from? It's in the forest. So that's a question. Remember, we have to oftentimes uh, read sections like these with a grain of salt and look at the essence of what it is and not be. Um, you know, sidetracked and uh, with the details that have nothing to do with the main message of the sutta, especially here, uh, as to what's about to happen. Then the Blessed One asked a certain bhikkhu to call the Venerable Ananda to him by saying, Go, bhikkhu, and say to Ananda, Friend Ananda, the teacher calls you. As you wish, Pante replied the bhikkhu while he went and informed the Venerable Ananda what the Blessed One had instructed him to do. And the Venerable Ananda immediately went to the Blessed One, paid homage to him, and sat down to one side. Then the Blessed One spoke to the Venerable Ananda by saying, Enough, Ananda, do not lament. Enough with the grieving. 
After all, have I not taught you all these years and from the very beginning how all that is dear and beloved to us will inevitably undergo change sooner or later? And how all that is born comes into being as the result of various conditions coming together remains to be subject to decay? Hence, how can one truly say, may it not, may it not come to an end or disillusion? This dissolution, meaning Ananda's thinking, oh, I'm losing my Bhante, my teacher, is dying. Well, is made from, you know, there's the sankaras, right? Sankata. It's based on conditions. And if it's based on conditions, then it is subject to impermanence. So you know this. So how can we hope that it will not? So that is part of the eternalist view. After all, there can never be such a state of affairs, Ananda. For a long time, Ananda, you have served the Tathagata with such loving kindness through physical deed, word, and thought. And you did these happily and always with a measureless loving heart and never with any hesitation. You have indeed accrued immeasurable merits and many blessings, Ananda. Therefore, Ananda, now you should just focus on putting forth exceptional energy and soon you too will be free from the mental contaminants, the asana. Praise of Ananda. Then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus by saying, Bhikkhus, the blessed ones, the arahants, the fully self-awakened Buddhas of times past, also had excellent and devoted attendant bhikkhus, exactly as I have had in Ananda, he says. Exactly. And similarly, bhikkhus, all the blessed ones, the arahants, the fully self-awakened Buddhas of the future, will also have excellent and devoted attendants, just like Ananda. Imagine what that must have done to Ananda's yeah, self-esteem. It would perk him up. He would just sit up straight and, and, and all of a sudden, oh, maybe, maybe I have been doing something right. Because in those moments, we've all gone through similar instances where we do what in psychotherapy we call, or psychology we call, all or nothing thinking. Where it becomes all you know, doom and gloom where we feel so small. In those moments, we need some metta towards ourselves. And then especially if it comes from the outside, especially people that we appreciate and hold in high regard, that really will make us feel good again. Because you will never attain any lofty states, not even a jhana, if you're feeling down, if you're depressed. It's impossible. And Lord Buddha is urging Ananda to continue to put effort to attain. But he knows he won't be able to attain anything if he's stuck in this weeping or depressed state of lamentation. For Ananda is indeed efficient and thoughtful, Bhikkhus, because he knows the appropriate time for Bhikkhus to have an audience with the Tathagata and the time for Bhikkhunis the time for male and female lay disciples, the time for kings and for ministers of state, and the time for teachers of other sects and for their followers. So he knows, he reads, like, is this a time? No, Lord Buddha is, 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 is not doing so well. He needs to rest. Plus, he's been teaching for hours. No, yeah, but this traveler seems like they've, gone, they've come a long way. Yeah, but they could wait. We'll give them a cup of water something, but they could wait. Lord Buddha needs to rest. And he knew this. So, uh, because there are four very rare and superlative qualities that are to be found in Ananda. What are these four? If Bhikkhus, a company of Bhikkhus, would go to see Ananda, their hearts would become joyful on seeing him. And if he then speaks to them on the Dhamma, they become uplifted by his discourse. And when he stops talking to them, they are disappointed for not having had enough, heard enough. So it is also when bhikkhunis, male and female lay disciples, who go to see Ananda. 
their hearts become joyful on seeing him. And if he then speaks to them on the Dhamma, they become uplifted by his discourse. And when he stops talking to them, they are disappointed for not having heard or had enough. These are the four very rare and superlative qualities that are to be found in Ananda. Because there are four very rare and superlative qualities that are to be found in a wheel-turning universal monarch. What are these four? So he, say, he states the same thing as he stated for Venerable Ananda. So he's placing him on the same level, uh, pedestal, as a wheel-turning monarch, which is a big designation. So that already puts, uh, gives enough accolades to uh, uh, Venerable Ananda. So I'm just going to go through that section, uh, um, jump over them rather, so we can make time. And in just the same way, because those same very rare and superlative qualities um, are also found to be found in Ananda. Section 32. Discourse about Mahasudassana, the wheel-turning universal monarch. The past glory of Kusinara. Once this had been said, the Venerable Ananda addressed the Blessed One by saying, Bhante, please may the Blessed One not pass away here in this wasteland of a town, this uncivilized and insignificant township in the midst of the jungle, a mere outpost of the province. Kushinara at that time is, is you know, apparently not that uh, well known of a place and uh, it's uncivilized, and it's not of the same level of, as Rajagha or Varanasi um, or Magadha of all places. So those were really big, big, uh, you know, the capitals of kingdoms and things. So, but here he says, please, Bhante, let's, let's, you know, put some energy, let's get up and, and let's walk a few hundred miles and go to another very well-known, <laughs> more reputable place. And he continues, after all, blessed Lord, there are several great cities not far from here, such as Champa, Rajagha, Samati, Saketa, Kosambi, and Benares. Let the blessed one please have his Pranibbana take place in one of those cities. Because in those cities, there are many wealthy nobles, excuse me, and Brahmins and householders who are dev devotees of the Tathagata. And they will be able to appropriately venerate and honor the remains of the Tathagata. So you can understand his thinking, uh, possibly, where given his reputation and contextually thinking, he's thinking, well, who, how are they going to, the people who live around here, how will they properly uh, venerate Lord Buddha's body when, you know, to cremate it? I mean, I don't think these people are going to be able to meet the level of veneration that they would be giving to a Chakavati, let alone a Tathagata. So, Bhante, let's go somewhere else. And this is Lord Buddha's response. Do not say so, Ananda. Do not say so. For in times long past, Ananda, there was a king by the name of Mahasudassana, who was a wheel-turning universal monarch who ruled with righteousness, a conqueror of the four quarters of the earth, whose realm was established in security, and who was endowed with the seven jewels. Now, Ananda, that king, Mahasudassana, had his royal residence here at Kusinara, which was then called Kusavati, and it extended 12 yojanas from east to west, and seven yojanas from north to south. And King Mahasudassana's capital, Kusavati, was mighty Ananda, prosperous, rich, and well populated, much visited by people, and abundantly provided with food and resources. Just as the royal residence of the deities, Ala Kamanda, is mighty, prosperous, rich, and well populated much visited by deities and abundantly provided with food and resources, so was the royal capital of Kusavati. Also Ananda, 
Kusavati resounded throughout both day and night with ten types of sound. The trumpeting of elephants, the neighing of horses, the rattling of chariots, the beating of drums and tambours. With music and song, cheers, the clapping of hands, the cries of eat, drink, and be merry as the tenth. Now Ananda, go to Kusinara and announce the mallas. So he says, we're in a good place. You might not see all of this that I described to you, but this is a very noteworthy place that we are at. And I'm about to go into Parinibbana. At. So he says, now go to the mallas. Mallas are the clan, the large clan of rulers who, and the population, basically, that ruled over Kushinara. There's also the Pava, but they're, they're both Mallas. Today, Vasit, so he's saying, go to the Mallas and announce to them by saying the following. Today, Vasit, in the last watch of the night, the Tathagata's Paridibbana will take place. Therefore, come, O Vasit, come before it is too late. Otherwise, you might regret later at the thought even though the Tathagata attained final Parinibbana in our very own township, we failed to see or pay our respects to him at the final hour. As you wish, Bhante, replied the Venerable Ananda as he prepared himself, and by taking his alms bowl and outer robe, he entered the city of Kusinara along with a companion. Remember, he was 80. He's the same age as Lord Buddha, so he definitely needs a companion. And the hour is, is, is getting late. Uh, section 33. The mullahs come paying their respects. Lamentation of the mullahs. Now at that time, the mullahs had gathered in their city hall, conducting some public affair. And the Venerable Ananda approached their gathering and announced to them. So he says to them what we just went over. In hearing these words, spoken by the Venerable Ananda, the stunned elders of the Mallas, along with their sons, their wives, and their daughters-in-law, suddenly became deeply distraught with grief-stricken hearts. Some removed their turbans and began to dishevel their hair, with arms uplifted in despair, weeping, flinging themselves on the ground and rolling from side to side as they sobbed, exclaiming, it is far too soon for the Blessed One to attain his final Parinibbana. It is way too soon for the Sugata to come to his Parinibbana. Too soon will the eye of the world vanish entirely from our sight. And thus, being deeply afflicted and with anguish in their hearts for their upcoming loss, the Mallas with their sons, their wives, and their daughters-in-law went to the Mallan Sal tree forest at Upavattana, to the place where the Venerable Ananda had already returned to, as each requested an audience with the Blessed One, each of the Mallas and their family. Then the Venerable Ananda began reflecting to himself, well, if I were to allow all the Mallas of Kusinara gathered here to pay their respects to the Blessed One one by one, then the night would have long passed and dawn appeared before all of them had presented themselves to the Blessed One. So we won't have enough time. And plus there's other people coming and plus we would want to also pay respect uh, as Bhikkhus is saying. So let me divide them according to their respective clans and by putting each family into a group, present them to the Blessed One thus. The mala of such and such a clan and family name, Bhante, has come with his wives and children, his attendants and friends, paying his respects at the feet of the Blessed One. And that is exactly what the Venerable Ananda did. Consequently, he was able to have all the mallas of Kusinara be presented to the Blessed One, where before long and prior to the first watch of the night, having fully passed, each mala and their family had already approached and paid homage at the feet of the Blessed One. So that also says again how efficient Venerable Ananda was with his you know, time management and uh, his skills in working and dealing with people. 
and crowds. Section 34. Subhadda, the wandering ascetic. The last convert. Now, at that time, a wandering ascetic by the name of Subhadda was living in the vicinity of Kusinara. And he happened to hear the following announcement being made by the townspeople. Today, during the third watch of the night, the final Parinibbana of the recluse Gautama will take place. By the way, for those of you who don't know, the, sometimes, oftentimes actually, we come across the first watch, second watch, and the third watch of the night. Um, so roughly speaking, um, they didn't have 6 o'clock, 7 p.m., 8 p.m., etc. So they would use the first watch, second, etc. But when we equate it with what we understand, um, it's basically around from around 6 p.m. to about 10 p.m., from 10 p.m. to 2 p.m. So 6 to 10 would be the first watch. Think of it like that. From 10 to 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. would be uh, around uh, the, the, the second watch of the night. And from 2 a.m. to about 5 or 6 a.m. Uh, would be the third watch of the night. Just to know, just, you know, a footnote there. So Subhadda heard that today, you know, the third watch of the night, Lord Buddha, or the recluse Gautama, because he was not a practitioner. He was not a follower of the Dhamma. That's why it's called a wandering ascetic. When uh, it says so, a paribhajika, for example, that means that they were of another sect. They were not practicing. They didn't have the Eightfold Path as their guide. And Subhadda began thinking to himself, I have often heard it being said by senior and venerable wandering ascetics, the teachers of teachers, that the arising of Tathagatas, those who are Arahants, self-awakened Buddhas, is very rare indeed in the world. Yet this very day, during the third watch of the night, the final Parinibbana of the recluse Gautama will take place. Now, I still feel the presence of skeptical doubts in my heart, but this much I also know and know for certain that I do have within me enough faith, and if anyone is able to remove that thorn of skeptical doubts from my heart, then it surely must be the recluse Gautama. So even though he says he doesn't, you know, he has doubts, he does sound like he has uh, sung vega, in fact. He has the urgency. He's like, now's the time. How often do Tathagatas show up? Well, uh, if you're a historian and you're looking at the Buddha's, Lord Buddha's contemporaries, you also will see that Nigantanataputta and uh, some of the other teachers of his, you know, his contemporaries used to also refer to themselves as the Tathagata. So the term Tathagata was not introduced by Lord Buddha, but like every other term that he used from uh, whatever was prevalent at the time, he gave it, rendered it a different, totally new meaning, definition. So uh, their understanding of Tathagata is completely different because they had anger, they had the Kileshas, in their hearts. Nigantanataputta, like I've covered several, I think it was last year, in Upali Sutta. You see how you know vulgar the, the teacher was, you know, doing things, saying things that any uh, non uh, you know uh, uh, disciple, non savaka would even you know think twice about. But he was supposedly a Tathagata, but he was acting in such a vulgar manner, still calling himself a Tathagata. Nevertheless, Subhadda says, I must go. He's the only one I feel who can remove the thorn from my heart. And you have some commentators who have attributed him to be, as, as uh, historically speaking, um, as the offspring of uh, um, uh, of, of, of uh, what, who ended up being an anagami and also uh, a teri, a bhikkhuni, who became an arahant. So he was their offspring, but I forgot their names, but 
um, the father they uh, attribute him uh, to be the son of the 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 man who uh, if you recall when Lord Buddha was um, thinking as to okay I should go and teach the five disciples when he first you know to turn the wheel of the Dhamma and as he was walking towards Isipatana he met this Brahmin this person on this on the road and the, per the person looks at him his features and his footprints and he says are you a god he says no are you a man he says no and he says I'm the Buddha and he the very short statement but this uh, person is put off by it. I forgot the name. I'm, I'm bad with names. But he goes and uh, he says, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. And he doesn't have that faith, but it triggers something in him. It makes him have the seeds, which later on linger in his heart. And he says, ah, in time, he even has a son. And then he leaves the family and he goes, and Lord Buddha knows this and tells Ananda, if such and such a person comes, approaches, let him in. And he does, and he teaches him, and, uh, but he dies as an anagami. So anyhow, um, I'm not too certain that that was the case. It's, again, when you leave it to the commentators, they can construct anything. That's why we have to always stick with the suttas. So anyhow, that's uh, kind of like uh, what I have in my research, I have heard and read, um, which I cannot verify, <laughs> of course, but something that I wanted to share with you so you would know as well. So anyhow, so then the wandering ascetic Subhadda also went to the Malla's Sal tree forest. And in approaching the Venerable Ananda, he expressed his desire to speak with the Blessed One by saying, I have often heard it being said by senior Venerable wandering. So he's saying what he was thinking or reflecting on, saying the Tathagatas are so rare. So I heard the Tathagata is going to die in the, in the third watch of the night. That's why I'm here. Now I still feel the presence of skeptical doubts in my heart. But this much I also know and know for certain that I do have within me enough faith. And if anyone is able to remove that thorn of skeptical doubts from my heart, then it surely must be the recluse Gautama. Therefore, friend Ananda, it would be good if I may be allowed into the presence of the recluse Gautama and have an audience with him. Now, this is a, one of those times where uh, Venerable Ananda is saying, no. Usually he's very accommodating, but this is where Lord Buddha is really tired. Remember, he just laid down and he's resting. But the Venerable Ananda replied, I am sorry, friend Subhadda. The Blessed One is tired and does not have the energy. Please do not trouble the Tathagata. In some places I've read uh, commentaries uh, where they mention how Subhadda had met Lord Buddha several times. And he engaged in debates. Wandering ascetics, Paribhajakas were also known to just enjoy debating. And uh, so he would just do that. And Lord Buddha would simply end up wasting his time. And it's very frustrating for a teacher to be in that position. And uh, so um, that's, that's how I am also highly influenced by, uh, again, Lord Buddha in that part as well, where whenever students come or whenever um, there is a gathering or retreats or Dhamma discussions, I always urge individuals not to have that contentious attitude when they're coming to meet uh, or to listen to a Dhamma talk. You know, they can do that outside and they can ask, <clears throat> I don't agree with this or whatever. So the person must have the willingness to learn, to learn and to have that humility. So if that would be the case, the, the, the commentator's statements about that Subhadda being the same as this Subhadda, then it's very understandable that Venerable Ananda was also influenced by that past history, if it existed. So, uh, but here, uh, Subhadda says again, but for a second and a third time, the wandering ascetic Subhadda kept making his request. And a second and a third time, the Venerable Ananda refused to allow him to see the Blessed One. 
In hearing the dialogue going on between the two, the Blessed One called out to the Venerable Ananda and said, <clears throat> Stop, Ananda. Do not reject Subhadda's request. Ananda, allow Subhadda to come into the presence of the Tathagata. For whatever he will ask me, he would be doing so for the sake of gaining understanding and not as a way to trouble the Tathagata. For the answer I will be giving him, he will quickly grasp and understand. This gives us an indication that very possibly Subhadda did engage in uh, arguments or debates with Lord Buddha in the past. That's why Lord Buddha is making that, uh, could be interpreted as such, making the um, statement that he's not going to be troubling the Tathagata. Let him in, let him in, let him come, because he's about to gain something. Thereupon, the Venerable Ananda said to the wandering ascetic Subhadda, in that case, friend Subhadda, go forward, for the Blessed One has given you the opportunity to have an audience, excuse me, with him. Then the wandering ascetic Subhadda approached the Blessed One and saluted him courteously. And having exchanged pleasant and civil greetings with the Blessed One, the wandering ascetic Subhadda sat to one side and addressed the Blessed One by saying, <clears throat> such a valuable, important question he will be asking, by the way. There are venerable Gautama, ascetics and Brahmins who are teachers to many disciples, who have large retinues of followers and are leaders of various schools, well-known and renowned, while being highly respected and esteemed by many such teachers as Purana Kassapa, Makkali Gosala, Ajita Kesa Kambali, Pakudha Kachayana, Sanjaya Belati Putta, Niganta Nata Putta. Now, based on what each of these teachers, as well as their own students, have all claimed, they have already attained full realization. But I am here to ask whether or not these are false claims by all of them, or at least some of them have attained to full realization. Enough, Subhanta. How is this going to help your situation now? How is this helping you now? Remember, I've said to several of you, how is this helping me now? When you have that negative chit-chat in your head, when you keep shooting yourself down, minimizing yourself, saying, I don't deserve metta, or at least feel like you don't deserve metta, how is this helping you? When you have a contentious attitude towards yourself or towards others or towards the Dhamma or towards life, how is that helping you? So how was this going to help him? If Lord Buddha said yes or no, how will that help Subhanda? He's saying, go after the big prize. Stop believing this intellect. Stop. Why does it matter to you, he says, whether these individuals have indeed attained or not? Instead, I will teach you the Dhamma, Subhadda. Now listen and pay very close attention, and I will speak. Yes, Bhante, replied Subhadda, the wandering ascetic. The lion's roar is the name of this section. And the Blessed One spoke by saying, In whatever Dhamma and discipline, Subhadda, where the Noble Eightfold Path is not found nor practiced, there too cannot be found a true religious practitioner. No Samana of the first level, no Samana of the second level, no Samana of the third level, and no Samana of the fourth level of sainthood. That means no Sotapanna, no Sakadagami, no Anagami, no Arahant could be found in any tradition that doesn't have, nor practice the Noble Eightfold Path, period, end of discussion. That pretty much eliminates many of the traditions out there, including many found within the Buddhist tradition. Whoever does not place the priority and importance on the Noble Eightfold Path, instead of doing some type of guru yoga, for example, some mantra practice, some this, some that, we need to bring it down to the nuts and bolts of the practice. Is there the Noble Eightfold Path? 
being assiduously practiced, adhered to, lived by, then you will have no problem in finding the four levels of sainthood, Lord Buddha is saying. But, Subhadda, in whatever Dhamma and discipline, where the Noble Eightfold Path is found in practice, there too can be found a true religious practitioner, a Samana of the first level, a Samana of the second level, a Samana of the third level, and a Samana of the fourth level of sainthood. Now, Subhadda, the Noble, path, the noble Eightfold Path is, found, is both found and practiced within this Dhamma and discipline. Therefore, in it alone are also found true religious practitioners. So this is the place he's saying. This is the place where you will attain. He didn't say, Nigantanata Putta is a fraud. Sanjaya Belati Putta is a fraud. Sanjaya, by the way, was uh, the teacher of Venerable Sariputta and uh, Mahamugalana over there. He didn't say, these are my competition. Forget about them. He's not saying that. He's, Lord Buddha was not going after anyone. He was just stating the facts. As you see, Subhadda, oh, so, excuse me, let me finish that. So now, Subhadda, the Noble Eightfold Path is found, both found and practiced within this Dhamma and discipline. And therefore, in it alone are also found true religious practitioners, samanas of the first level. Samanas of the second level, Samanas of the third level, and Samanas of the fourth level of sainthood. As you see, Subhadda, empty of true religious practitioners, devoid of true Samanas, are the systems of all other teachers, their schools, and their traditions. I might have spoken too soon, because Lord Buddha is just saying they don't have it. And so long as Subhadda, the bhikkhus continue to practice constantly while living the proper religious life with virtuous behavior, then this world will never be deprived of arahants. Now, a person listening to me, a bhikkhu in the Theravada tradition, might say, oh, you're being biased, this and that. I might be, but at the same time, there's also the statement from Lord Buddha. He says, as long as, so long as the bhikkhus continue to practice. So simply having the Noble Eightfold Path, putting them in nice golden leafed, framed in crystals in an, on an altar and chanting it for hours and days and months does not mean that that tradition, including Theravada, that does that, that does not practice what it is saying that they will continue to have the four levels of sainthood. No. The, we will also fall into the same category as Nigantanata Puttas. Let's not make a mistake about that. So we're not keeping up pretenses. That's why Lord Buddha was insistent on mentioning, uh, stressing the Patipada, the practice, the path of practice. The Eightfold, Noble Eightfold Path is a path to be practiced, to be walked on, not talked about. That's what makes this path noble. Otherwise, it's just rites and rituals, nonsense. Puja, nonsense. Lord Buddha's Dhamma is alive only when it is practiced by you, not by someone else. Not by you putting a printing or having a gold glazed picture of a teacher and hanging it on your wall and doing pujas and, and, and don't, no no none of that it's to be practiced by each and every one of us he says so long as that's the case then this world will never be deprived of arahants today each of you could turn into an arahant could you consider that possibility And Lord Buddha says this in verse to Subhadda. I was just 29 years old, Subhadda, when I renounced the world by going forth, seeking what is good. 51 years have now passed since then, Subhadda. And in all that time, a wanderer I have been, with a mind that is collected and wisdom in the heart. I have been showing the way to virtue and of true dhamma. 
Outside of here, there cannot be found a true practitioner, a genuine samana of the first level of sainthood. Outside of here, there cannot be found a true practitioner, a genuine samana of the second level of sainthood. Outside of here, there cannot be found a true practitioner, a genuine samana of the third level of sainthood. Outside of here, there cannot be found a true practitioner, a genuine samana of the fourth level of sainthood. He's made it very clear. And this goes uh, against uh, political correctness in this culture where you have even Buddhist teachers. You have Teras and Ajans and Wangpurs and all kinds of teachers who come out and say, well, we're all the same. Christianity, Buddhism, Taoism, Hinduism, this ism, Judaism, Islam, all these things are all the same, ultimately. What a nonsense. Imagine if they were in the presence of Lord Buddha. Would they even dare to utter such nonsense in his presence? That's a shame for teachers. Theravada tradition. I'm not even talking about Mahayana and Vajrayana. Theravada teachers have said this. And they're respected, they're worshipped. People have made even statues of them. How does that go in line with what we just read, Lord Buddha saying? It doesn't. So don't believe everything you hear, even if it's coming from a Theravada tradition. On the surface, shack it against the suttas. And you see loud and clear many of the things that you might hear or read about don't match with the teachings of Lord Buddha. And last week, we also uh, were talking about the four great sources that Lord Buddha talked about, how to check as reference, to see if, has Lord Buddha really said this? You have the right to do so. Don't blindly believe anything. And Subhadda, so long as the bhikkhus continue to practice constantly while living the proper religious life with virtuous behavior, then this work will never be deprived of arahants. Lord Buddha repeats himself. When this was said, the wandering ascetic Subhadda spoke to the Blessed One by saying, It is excellent, Blessed One. It is marvelous, Blessed One. The Blessed Lord has clarified the Dhamma for me in many ways, as though he were to turn upright what had been turned upside down, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see. Bhante, I go to the Blessed One for refuge, and to the Dhamma, and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. And then he adds, Bhante, may I receive the going forth by being granted the higher ordination in the presence of the Blessed One. So he's asking to become a Bhikkhu, obtaining the Upasampada. Subhadda, this is Lord Buddha responding, Whoever formally has received ordination in another religious tradition, hence a follower of another creed, on wishing to receive admission and a higher ordination in this Dhamma and discipline, must remain on probation for a period of four months. This is in relation to adults. So we know that Subhadda was over 20 years old. At the end of those four months, if the bhikkhus are satisfied with him, they may grant him full admission and the higher ordination as a bhikkhu. However, in this matter, I do see differences of personalities and recognize you as an exception. Lord Buddha made these rules. Rules are there not to create suffering. Rules are there to help ease suffering, reduce suffering. So Lord Buddha is seeing, and he's also seeing and feeling and knowing what is going on in the heart of Subhadda. And then let's hear what Subhadda says. Blessed Lord, seeing that it is a requirement for me to be on probation for four months prior to be granted the full admission and the higher ordination as a bhikkhu, then I will remain on probation for a period of four years. So that means that he's so intent, like he's found it. He says, Bhante, I totally respect it, but if it pleases you, I will even go 10 times that much time, you know, the, the probation. And at the end of those four years, if the bhikkhus are satisfied with me, then let them grant me the full admission and the higher ordination as a bhikkhu. 
However, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the Blessed One called the Venerable Ananda and said to him, in that case, Ananda, let Subhadda go forth by giving him admission into the order. As you wish, Bhante, replied Ananda. Then the wandering ascetic Subhadda said to the Venerable Ananda, Friend Ananda, it is such a blessing. What a great fortune and a marvelous gain for me that in the presence of the master himself, you, friend Ananda, are about to give me the sprinkling of ordination as a disciple. You can tell the joy. The bl he's blissed out. He's so happy. Because he knows that Lord Buddha is going to die. Everyone knows who's there. Now, thus, the wandering ascetic Subhadda, in the presence of the Blessed One, received his full admission and the higher ordination as a bhikkhu from the Venerable Ananda and the Sangha of Bhikkhus. So he became a bhikkhu himself. From the moment of his ordination, the Venerable Subhadda lived alone, secluded and withdrawn from the crowd, energetic and diligently working, while maintaining continuity of mindfulness throughout. And before long, the Venerable Subhadda realized for himself directly with unshakable wisdom and through his own efforts, the supreme goal of the holy life, for the purpose of which good sons of families rightfully leave the household life and go forth, becoming homeless as he entered into and remained in that unshakable serenity of the heart. Right then he knew for himself, birth is now finally destroyed. The holy life has now been fully lived. Whatever work that had to be completed is now completed and done. There is no more return to any state of becoming. And the Venerable Subhadda became one of the Arahants, and he became known as the last personal disciple of the Blessed One. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Some might think that Venerable Subhadda um, had to strive for many, well, many years or months or days at least in hearing that section. But uh, we know from the commentators uh, that in fact, he did it on that same night before Lord Buddha closed his eyes for the last time. So Lord Buddha was even more content because Subhadda became an Arahant. So he didn't just become a bhikkhu. That is the meaning of having Sangvega. Maintaining Sangvega is so crucial. And uh, this, is, uh, this is really at the crux of why we succeed or not succeed. Looking at it on a mundane level, you only get paid if you're an employee, if you work, if you have your own business. You only get paid if you do work, if you have something in place, a mechanism that creates the opportunities for you to gain money, to gain profit. But that took some work from someone. Even if you're sitting there on investments and they're just give, bringing you dividends, for example, or something like that, still, you're involved somehow or other. The same thing with as simple as looking at your own breathing. If you don't breathe, you die. If you don't eat, you die. There's a level of urgency there, isn't, isn't it? It's there. Somehow we, we, we neglect when it comes to the path, when, we, when it comes to the practice. We look at the same thing with, with food, for example. If you keep eating fast food, junk food, greasy food, heavy food, you know what's going to happen. You're going to develop diabetes, you're going to get fat, and you're going to die with a lot of pain. We know that. That's why we try to police ourselves. So even something, things that are so mundane on the gross level as those, we accept. We don't question at all. Bills, another thing. Paying your rent, your mortgage. If you don't, you know what's going to happen. Somebody's going to come and evict you. 
That's a level of urgency, right? But when it comes to the practice, somehow we are very blasé about it. That's why the arahants of recent past, even Webu Sayadaw, he would say, if you put a mediocre effort into the practice, you're going to get mediocre result, results. He says, you keep asking me about arahantship. I will tell you this. It requires, and he doesn't talk about himself, he says, the arahants of the past, he says, have attained to that level of freedom, not by putting in mediocre effort. He said they had exceptional effort being placed. It didn't fall. Even someone as, uh, as, as uh, noteworthy as Bahia. We think, oh, he was just right at the right place at the right time and he just had the right merits and right punya. No, he had much more than that. He had the urgency. He ran about 700 miles. I mean, do the math from, from Mumbai, the area a little bit north of Mumbai on the coast, all the way to Savati. He did it in three days. That qualifies as, as urgency in my book. So that's exceptional effort. So when you're sleeping at night, and you want to get your eight hours of sleep, your cherished, noble, sacrosanct eight hours or nine hours or seven or whatever it is of sleep. Oh, I have a meeting. I have an important meeting tomorrow. I have to. Okay. But then your mind says, uh, hey, excuse me, this is your sati. If you really have been working hard, sati comes and says, hmm, what is that thought? What is that thought? Are you waking up? You know? And you wake up and you say, no, 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 I'm going to shut my eyes and go put my squeeze and sink my head into the pillow and force myself to sleep because, hey, I look at the clock and it's two hours short from the time, from my alarm, actually. And you try for a few minutes and your body says, mm, your mind says at least, no. That is a beautiful moment. Sit, get up. At least. Lay on your right side and then just put your hand over there. Just say, I'm going to be mindful. I'm going to practice sati as long as it's possible. And if the body really wins the race, in a sense, let me fall asleep with mindfulness. But uh, until that moment comes, I'm going to maintain sati and sampajanya. That is also creating urgency, even if you're a householder. Even if you have to wake up tomorrow and go to that very important meeting, you have to pay mortgage, you have to pay for your food, this and that. You have to take your children to the school, for example. So we have so many, there's so many, plenty of opportunities to practice the Dhamma. No excuses, no excuses. And pujas or rites and rituals will not substitute. They will not ever get us to become sotapannas, period. In case, I mean, you don't have to believe me. You just We just went over the sutta. So I will pause here and see if there are any questions, uh, comments, thoughts. Oh, it's a beautiful sutta. <laughs> yes. Bhante, mm -hmm. one question on the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, we often look at puja as a practice, physical mm -hmm. effort. Is the Noble Eightfold Path really a mental exercise of awareness, sati sampajana? I mean, it happens in the mind. Everything is mind-made. And uh, we are actually conditioned to believe that this Eightfold Path is a physical exercise where we have to bow down 108 times, for example, recite and chant for 108 times, for example. So we actually brought up to believe and are influenced into views. 
Whereas when I look at the Eightfold Path, I see restriction and refraining. Restriction of physical action and refraining of mental capacity, like example, Hiri and Otapa. We are reluctant to do something because we have a certain abhorrence, fear, mm -hmm. desisting from doing something. Mm -hmm. It is innately in us. And we are told something else. So mm -hmm. there starts a conflict, a conflict between wanting and being told to obey. Uh -huh. And here is where I find the challenge. And it is, it is lovely that you share that uh, challenge because I think uh, you, you vocalized it, uh, that is, because many of us listeners uh, to uh, your comments or question uh, can relate to that. Um, whatever tradition you're coming from, not just uh, in Buddhism. So, but we have to be careful Yes, on one end, you have one, let's say, a group, let's say, uh, who might be saying to you, no, you need to show it physically. You need to bow down this way. And by the way, 108 times is actually really low in number. I mean, if you go to uh, Vajrayana in, in Nundro, you are talking about 110,000 frustrations. 110,000. You go to Bodh Gaya, by the way, if you go, you will see them around in the vicinity, around the, the main shrine. You're going to see many, many hundreds of uh, uh, monks, Vajrayana monks, Imagine. doing that, and not just monks. Now, that's one extreme of, well, by the way, wrong view, just to clarify. There's Michaditi there. That's not going to take you to Nibbana. It's like somebody who would say, um, if I chant mantras or if I do hatha yoga, you know, this is another thing that people had uh, for centuries in India. If I do these postures, these asanas, they will take me to moksha, for example. None of that. That's it. It's not going to happen. Uh, so that's an extreme. The other extreme is saying, no, 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 no. It's all mental. The Eightfold Path, I have to have a mental attitude and understanding of a probing into the Noble Eightfold Path and applying application of it in the mental arena. That's another extreme. And both of them miss the mark. So I invite you to look at it in terms of horizontal and vertical. So I'm, this is in, in addressing your comments about restraining and refraining, or later you mentioned Hiri and Ottapa. Hiri, for listeners who haven't heard me mention this, it is, uh, in English, we could translate it as wise, uh, moral um, fear, or uh, shame, rather. Wise moral shame. Sometimes people have said shame. Well, shame can bring up some negative, nasty uh, uh, feelings in a person's yes. mind, you know, based on our childhood and all that. So, so that's not you know, we, I don't like to use that. So, but it's wise and it's morally solid shame. So that completely changes it. And it's very internal based. It's the person's attitude towards it, but it does have definitely restraint and refraining from certain things. And then you mentioned otapa. Otapa is the one where it's, it's a wise moral consideration to looking at others, that uh, individuals that you hold dear to your heart, uh, really value, let's say, Lord Buddha, his teachings. Imagine him say, sitting there next to you. You know, uh, I was uh, giving a talk uh, a few weeks ago in Yerevan, and it was uh, at a group, and um, it was an Aikido place, um, and they had invited me because uh, there are no bhikkhus, <laughs> you know, uh, in Armenia or let alone Armenian culture, you know, there's, you know, I'm there. So, and uh, one of the co comments were about uh, Sila and because I talked to them about Sila Samadhi Panya. And he said, what about the middle past? So he had apparently read and it was a very respectful 
a presentation of a question. And what about this? So he was saying he was misinterpreting what I described to you. One extreme, one extreme in the middle. So we can have a little bit of this, right? A little bit of that. So instead of three glasses of wine, I could have one. Instead of smoking three, four packs of cigarettes a day, I could have one. And I looked around and there was this little child sitting there. Someone had brought their children and you know, others were also there. And she, she looked so lovely and sitting there across from the teacher, the person, he was a teacher of the dojo. And I said to her, and I said, how old are you? And she said, you know, I'm eight. And I asked for her name, so lovely. And I turned back to the questioner and I said, look at her. Now I want you to see her with a cigarette in her mouth. And he's like, and you could see his disgust. He's like, no. I said, what happened? What happened? To the middle path that you had constructed in your head. The same thing with some teachers in some Theravada tradi traditions. Uh, you have teachers who have publicly, in some cases, been smoking. And they justify, their students definitely justify. And my answer to them is very simple. As you're going about justifying this nonsense, try to imagine Lord Buddha smoking. Could you do that? Even for a millisecond, or a child, a baby. So we have to be very careful with um, the two extremes plus misinterpret. Both of them are michaditi, by the way, as also the wrong uh, belief or wrong view about mis the misunderstanding of the middle path. So we have to be careful. So yes, there's restraint and refrain, but Lord Buddha didn't just teach that. Hence, I gave you the example, uh, I mentioned to you briefly, Think of things as um, those two lines, horizontal and vertical. So if we use the reference you made of Hiri and Notapa, and we're giving it the title of re restraint and refrain, let's say, which is important to create that foundation of sila, it's not enough. You have to also engage in the vertical aspect of the path. Okay? So you don't just sit there and restrain, restrain yourself because that would also mean there is no wisdom. And how is wisdom going to come about? Through the practice of samadhi. Hence, we have the three trainings, sila, samadhi, panya. Otherwise, Lord Buddha would never have become Lord Buddha. He would have still become a, been a parajika, a varibhachaka, meaning a wandering ascetic himself for years and maybe not even last that much because he was about to die that's why he changed his direction so restraint and refrain are very important but you need to have the proactive approach in doing something with the benefits that are coming to you thanks to sila this path is not just based on sila sila is important but we don't stop there we move from it and that definitely requires your body this is where I'm coming directly to your question about the Noble Eightfold Path. Can it be just mental? No. Remember, it has sila, samadhi, panya within it, the structure of the Noble Eightfold Path. path. So you have right speech, right? You have right action, right? What is that? Physical. How can you practice uh, pancha sila just with your mind? Especially when you're in a, in a standing there at the watering hole and your colleagues, your friends start talking about a colleague, someone else who's not there, and they're gossiping and you feel the urge to say and you go ahead and say it. How did you say it? Just with your head or with your body as well? You see? So that's when you pull the practice out of the vihara and the puja and the rites and rituals. And you pull it also out from your head. That, yeah, 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 I'm practicing, I'm practicing. Yeah, I'm reading the suttas. Yes, yes, I'm memorizing the Abhidhamma, this and that. I must be practicing. No, you're not. You're bringing them out of the closet, each of those closets, and you're bringing them and you're including them into the 
delicious, fertile soil that is your daily life. And that is where your Nibbana is going to happen. Nowhere else. Not while you're reading suttas and just thinking that that's the only thing that you need to be doing. No. That's why Lord Buddha talked about Sati and Sampajanya. That's where it happens, not just in your head. But that's what we have over the centuries. People have misused, misinterpreted. That's why Lord Buddha says, you start with wrong view and everything else will be wrong, including your samadhi will be wrong, including your sila. That's why it's so convoluted. You look around. That's why I keep saying if this state of affairs continues, the Dhamma will not stay for long. See, it won't. Unless you bring it into your life, out of your head, out of the temple, and put it in your life. Go to the temple. Do those pujas if you want. Yes. One question from this, Bhante. In terms of what you mentioned about right speech, Vitaka Vichara, that inquiry to respond or react, it's <laughs> also happening in the mind where we can be aware of what we want to reply or respond. So in that sense is where I asked this question about mental, but I agree totally with what Bante, what you mentioned about the part of going upwards, which is actually the effort which we put in. Mm -hmm. The effort which is uh, Samavayama. Mm -hmm. And in that effort, can I ask you Bante, Hiri and Otapa, is it actually in Samvega or Samvara or is it in Prahana? Which is the area of uh, Hiri and Otapa? Any practice that is legitimate practice where the person is putting in effort to maintain sati definitely must have within its sang vega, whether it's announced in big letters or not. Okay? okay. So the right effort, whether it's sang, sangvara or pahana or anurakkana, all these things, they are, again, be careful when you're using a lot of these terminologies and a lot of these concepts, okay? Having worked with you personally, it's very <laughs> conceptual, okay? And it's understandable. It's understandable. This is why there is a danger when you are being taught for years in Asia or elsewhere, where the focus is only intellectual. Well, that is like a bird trying to fly with one wing. How successful do you think they're going to get? No matter how lofty the concepts are, who cares if you interpret the Noble Eightfold Path as Noble Eightfold Path or supernatural Eightfold something? It doesn't change the fact that there is ignorance. The person has to apply it. So vitakka vichara, yes, it is the vachisankara, yes. But how does that reduce your kilesha when you do have the urge? Go ahead and talk to those thoughts you're thinking and pondering, which are vachisankara. Mm. Go to talk okay. to them at that moment when you are so heated. No when someone is really pushing your buttons. Go and try to talk to them. It's like somebody who's saying, who's so hungry, and looks at a menu or thinks of a meal and says, yes, I've eaten that bowl of soup or I've eaten that bowl of rice or I've eaten that pizza. Yes, I'm full. What? Your stomach is going to say, uh, excuse me, I beg to differ. But many of us have convinced ourselves that we are practicing when we're not. Knowing the sankharas, the deviation, the, 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 the branching outs of all these things means nothing. I often uh, quote Venerable, uh, the late Venerable uh, Bhantinyanananda, who was one of the Arahants, but who was never actually given his due respect. Even in Sri Lanka, he was in fact persecuted because his... Uh, his interpretation, and he was par excellence top of his of his love of, of understanding of the Dhamma. But he had both. 
not just intellectual understanding, academic. He had also a PhD, but he lived in a cave, in a kuti. He wrote some wonderful books based on the Dhamma, suttas especially, and the practice. He would always go into the laboratory of human living experience and apply and go and probe the suttas and then see if it didn't match. He was practicing the four right sources as we went over. He was a true bhikkhu. He was a true practitioner of a dhamma. Now, he wasn't a singular example. There's many others, but not that many. So use the intellectual understanding that you've gained from reading and from your other teachers. That's beautiful. But stop pitching the tent there. Take down that tent. In fact, burn it. Okay? And start applying even this much of whatever you have learned from those teachers, no matter how eminent they have been. Stop attaching yourself to teachers. That's what I've seen in Asia happening, especially in Asia, where people have considered that to be the Dhamma. It is not the Dhamma. Forget it. This is your valuable life. Stop wasting it away. When my teacher said this, my teacher explained it this way, yes, people listen to Dhamma discussions in their cars and tapes and this and that, and they think they're practicing because they're getting filled up with some sentimentality and emotionality and their mem memories kick in. And yes, I had this moment with my teacher and this. And okay, how is that getting you closer to Nibbana? How is this helping me now? Remember? Always ask that because you're playing with your life. And there's no guarantee. Be like Bahia, the Venerable Bahia. And that is when you are practicing the four right efforts. That is when you're definitely practicing Sang Vega. And Lord Buddha would smile to you. Okay? Thank you, Venti. You're most welcome. Well, I will stop here because my throat is <laughs> really... <laughs> so... I'm glad uh, these are wonderful questions also. Uh, I appreciate it because it resonates with many people also, um, I believe. Um, those of you who are here and those who will be listening to this uh, later. So let us uh, transfer some merits. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find health relief. May all beings share in these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of wholesome happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share in these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May you be well. May the triple gem protect you. May the blessings of the triple gem be with you and your loved ones, especially as you're working with the horizontal and the vertical, practicing sila, samadhi, and panya. Don't worry about panya. Panya will come. It's not something that you could read. No. Panya will come when you have the other first two prerequisites, sila and samadhi. Nowhere is there puja. Do you see any puja there? No. Okay? Dana is good. Dana is part of the puja. I'm not against puja. But just Take it, tone it down, okay? Just a little bit. Just to get the mind in the right space. And that's enough. That's enough. So next week we will uh, continue on and uh, it will be the last part of the uh, Mahaparinibbana Sutta, which I will do my best to finish. And uh, so I will leave you with that and uh, may you be blessed and Suki Hoto. Till next time. Okay, well, Are we doing a closing, Bente? Uh, closing? Uh, well, <laughs> I did it in English, but uh, why not? We'll do it in Pali. Akasa tacha bhumata deva nagama hittika punyantang anumoditva chiranga kantu lokadasanang. Akasa tachabu mata deva nagama hindika punyantang anumoditva chirangra kantu de sanang. Akasa tachabu mata deva nagama hindika 
Punyan tanganumoditva chirangarakantu mamparanti. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, Thank you, Bhante. Good night. Good night to all of you. May you be blessed. Keep smiling. Good night, everyone. <laughs> good night. Good night, all.